Welcome to a special edition of the Optimized Podcast 23 Unfolded Key Insights from the Optimized Podcast. I'm Don Wilson, and today we're revisiting last year's most compelling themes and conversations. Welcome to the Optimized Podcast, brought to you by Visible Thread. We bring you the best and latest insights for everything from government contracting on topics such as BD, capture, proposal management, and business writing. Every series of Optimize is hosted by an expert in their field who brings their expertise and real-life experience to each episode. This podcast series is hosted by Ton Wilson, president of Intellect. Ton is a renowned GovCon influencer who has spearheaded business processes and bid strategies that have clinched contracts worth over $150 billion to her clients. She is a bid strategist, executive coach, mentor, Marvel and DC enthusiast, and self-proclaimed bourbon lover. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe on wherever you are listening. Now let's join Ton on this episode. Today, we're revisiting last year's most compelling themes and conversations. From communication challenges to AI's transformative impacts, we engage in discussions that enlightened and challenged our perspectives. So grab a drink and let's dive back into these moments and uncover the insights defining our year. Theme one, effective communication. Our journey begins with the pivotal essence of effective communication, a cornerstone of business success. In this highlight reel, we're revisiting the most compelling segments of our past episodes, featuring insights from industry leaders and experts. They don't just discuss effective communication, they demonstrate its profound impact on real world business scenarios. Get ready to be captivated by these influential conversations and discover how communication can be your gateway to success in the competitive business landscape. For me, uh, I mean, as you said, it doesn't always go smoothly, right? And so I've always understood and wanted and sought after good capture strategies because good capture strategies lead to good proposal strategies. What I sort of intonated at the beginning is uh, while I focus on proposals in my organization, we do some limited capture and we do some limited capture mostly out of necessity. Uh, When you find that the capture hasn't been developed properly, what happens is you constantly seek the answers, the information, the strategy, the solutions, the discriminators, the gaps, et cetera, uh, that you're missing uh, for the elements of telling the the true compelling story. Um, and so I think for, for me, I see things like that not necessarily always going well when you haven't developed and documented, frankly, um, a really well-developed capture strategy. Uh, it becomes one of those things where you then sort of have to peel back the onion from proposals and get to the core, the center of, uh, I guess, the goodness of an onion. Um, <laughs> in order to get to the actual story there. So um, so yes, we see that that doesn't always happen, I think, as, uh, as beautifully as we would like it to. Uh, but uh, I definitely like to see good capture strategies documented in proposals. Absolutely. Uh, you read my mind completely because I was thinking about the handoff and one of the uh, other mantras is that um, we can't read minds. The proposal team cannot read minds. And so... You know, we sometimes will see even during like a pink team or a red team or even further along the process, you'll see comments of like, why is not this, you know, in the proposal? Why are we talking about X? Why, why wasn't Y highlighted? And that's because it's living in the head of a capture team member or an executive or a PM, but it was never transitioned over either through a solutioning session or a documented documentation, you know, maybe a kickoff briefing or notes in a capture record. So I'm not a fan of busy work or, you know, documentation for documentation to say like, you know, big, big slide decks of like capture like a hundred slides. Like, no, I'm not a fan of that. We talk about it all the time. I'm not going to say work life bound, not going to say it. It's a fallacy. It's a proverbial carrot. We constantly chase and it's a lie. Um, sorry. <laughs> but it's true. And, and not just, you know, in proposal industry, but American culture, the way that we work is very different from a European culture. Um, we are taught early on to to drive work ourselves into the ground. And if you are not pulling, you know, extra hours or whatever, or being the top seller performer, then you are not successful. And that's not true. We're all successful in our own ways and it looks different for everyone. So with these capabilities and with this time, keep yourselves well. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. 100%. 
preach, testify. I want to say work-life balance is more of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. If you put it in, you'll, you're going to suffer, right? So when Anatolia was speaking earlier and she said, oh, we saved 70 hours of, of human labor by running visible thread. So for your team, for those 70 hours, did you then give them 70 hours more worth right. of work to do? Or did they get to go pick up their kids from practice this afternoon because they had time to do that? You know, for us being, and I, and I think it's a generational thing. I think we're, you know, Gen X be what it is. You know, we were driven. We were independent. We were latchkey kids. We're not going to deny that. We know we, what we need to do in order to get through our lives. And we're just not going to stop. So if the tool is giving us our time back, we owe it to ourselves to take that time. Speak with your leadership. You brought me a tool. It gave me more time. Does that mean I can do more proposals? No, it does not. We had, um, in one of my earlier jobs, I had a leader say, if I get you another proposal manager, how many more proposals can you do? <laughs> my answer was none. My answer was, I will do the ones I'm already doing even better. Yeah. If you're not using that time that you get back, to make your product better, you're just making more products not any better. How can we ensure clarity um, and engagement where when we're trying to convey a company's branding narrative without, you know, going into this alphabet soup or industry jargon? Yeah, I, I definitely agree. It's it's really easy to get lost. Uh, I like your your the way you phrase it in a jungle of jargon. Um, and yeah, no group deals with more jargon than government contractors, um, the alphabet soup and all of the acronyms. And really to to be able to clearly articulate your value and the problems that you solve, the pain that you take away um, and un, you know just understanding who it is that you're trying to influence are really key. We at Ocean 5, we work with government contracting companies and we see a lot of techno speak on their websites, their capability statements, and even just talking to them, you know, one to one in person, um, you know, most often the people that these companies are trying to communicate with are not actually the technical people. So people need to keep in mind that you're creating messaging that really needs to speak human. And, um, you know, don't assume the people that are, for instance, coming to your website and reading your RFP responses are the technical people. Uh, what the people what the people really want to know is how are you going to solve their problems? Um, they need to solve their problems, they need to meet their deadlines, and they need to achieve their mission. And they're not really concerned with what gadget, gizmo, service you're going to do it with. Um, these people these people are people, and and they need to know how you're going to help them. Um, we found that often having an outside party uh, conduct. A strategic meeting of all the stakeholders to draw out all that critical information and then condense it down and and so they can actually now clearly articulate how do you think that the internal champions and, and all those kind of involved can effectively foster um, feedback and, and how and what does that feedback look like for success so that's a great point about the kind of feedback loop uh, tom the key points, and it kind of ties in with our previous discussions. When you do any kind of change management, be it in a small to medium business or be it in an enterprise, it is really important to have an understanding of how you're going on the actual rollout, how you're going on the actual change of behavior. And the only real way you can do that effectively and yield a successful result ultimately is tight cycles, tight feedback loops, situations where instead of considering it, okay, we're going to roll this out and six months, in six months, we're going to see if it's working or not. Instead of that, you look at kind of two, four week increments and you just tighten it down and you allow yourself the ability to course correct. So it's kind of a fundamental tenant of, you know, an agile approach. I mean, in, in the world of IT, we talk about agile approaches, meaning tight delivery cycles. The rationale for doing that is that you time box on a very tight time frame, and you check the results. You need to understand what results you want and you see whether you're in the right direction or not. And then you shift course as you need because life doesn't work in a static way. So it's not like we have this master plan. It's going to take, you know, four months to conceive and then we're going to roll it out. It's going to be another four or six months and then we're going to see the results. It's much more 
okay, the first month is what's our initial place that we want to see change? A, a, a tiny sliver of the overall objectives. Let's measure that. Let's course correct as we need. Let's get people involved. And that's an entirely, you know, it's, it's, it's completely dependent on effective communication for the, both the coordinating party and in a large organization that's a dedicated person in a smaller organization that's going to be a part of the C-suite in some way. It'll be a part of their status, their weekly status calls. Okay, we bought this software. We expected it to do X. Is it doing X? Who's supposed to be using it? Are they using it? Have they been trained on it? Are they getting the results we thought we would get when we actually signed off on the purchase order on this and the investment? Because if you don't do that, and we, we have examples where customers, and it's befuddling, it's, it's crazy. They buy our software and they pay no attention to the post-purchase point. It's almost as if like they believe it's just going to magically work on its own. It isn't. And if you don't have your people using it effectively, and then we spend a lot of time and energy, you know, having our staff, our customer success staff, uh, working closely with our customers once once the software is bought. But if if you can't get that engagement on the other side, it's a waste of time. We're all concerned. It's like the old phrase goes: you can bring the horse to water, but you cannot make the horse drink. And right. in this case, we see it, and it's it's a very strange thing. You wonder why would somebody drop X thousand dollars on a piece of software? when they're not going to actually give it a fair crack at actually being successful. And that is right back to that whole idea of how do you do successful change in behavior? And that is predicated on a huge, to a huge extent, on effective communication, both internal yeah. and external. Theme two, technology and AI. Next, we discuss the world of technology and artificial intelligence, exploring the nexus of innovation and practicality. In these segments, our podcast sheds light on the intricate processes and evaluation approaches governing cutting-edge technologies and AI integration and adoption. We'll hear from our thought leaders and experts who embrace these advancements and critically analyze their potential to revolutionize our industry. This journey is not about adopting new tools. It's about opening our minds to the possibility of technology and AI. Join us as we explore the transformative power of these technologies and unwrap how they can be harnessed to propel us into a future with untapped potential and unprecedented success. How do you perceive AI's influence, especially given the, the small business um, an edge, like you've said? Great question. Um, you know, you're watching in real time how AI is making a change. And I, I do want to take it back a little while. Um, I've been doing a lot of robotic process automation. RPA uh, wasn't called that before. It was just process automation. Uh, and there were other things that you would do because we've been building uh, automated business processes for a very long time. This falls in line with what people started to look at AI as, as a way of just automating out certain things. Added a future uh, machine learning element. Machine learning, just to kind of cap that, machine learning is where you've taught the machine to learn from the different things that you are putting into the system. So the data you're feeding it is allowing it to train itself and it is able to learn on its own. Um, but you've got to set those algorithms up of how it learns. I don't want to go down into that. We don't have anywhere near enough time just to talk about the simple ways right. of doing that. But the machine learning has taken it to that next level and it's allowing for small businesses to start to leverage the intelligence of other people's craft. And what I mean by that is take us back to the proposal writing experience. Uh, I'm somebody who I have a very good technical acumen. I've been a, a chief enterprise architect for, it was CSC at the time, then CSRA, now GDIT. Uh, I was rated as one of the top 5% in the company because of the acumen I had for the technical piece. I was very good at doing technical, but very poor at writing. Writing's not my thing. It takes me a long time to figure out what words to put in place. I can take a technical bullet point drop it into a AI a large language model like ChatGPT, and I can turn out a proposal response in two hours, what used to take me two weeks to turn out because I just take so long to write. So from a small business standpoint, it really helps uh, the technical people to be able to provide their expertise quickly in a way that enables us to kind of turn out pros, pros and well-written pros at that point for the company. 
So there was a term used by one of the attendees here that I loved was being process agnostic. And I always use the term tool agnostic, right? And so it doesn't matter what process I'm trying to, um, you know, like improve or what problem or, you know, solution I'm trying to provide. I look at the process and what the problem is first. And then I decide, is there a tool um, to, you know, to use to kind of solve that? Like in this whole, like we've thrown out a lot of different types of tools here today. Visible thread is a tool, grammar, like there's so many out there. How do you pick the right tool for the process or do you shape the process around a tool? I love that question. People process tools, right? We're technology. There's an order there. The people have to know what they're doing. The process has to be in place in order for the tool to fit into the process. If you think you need a tool, but you don't know why, you don't need a tool, you need a process. Once you figure out what step that is, then you find the tools that can help you make those steps be accomplished faster. That's that co-pilot philosophy, right? How can I use technology to make me better at my job, not to replace me from being able to do my job? So. The way I see it is, you know, your people need to understand kind of the gist. What do you need to get out of the process? They need to then develop that process before you can even consider what tool, because that tool might change what your process ends up being. Then then it becomes a cycle. And I, I think for a proposal person in general, you know, we all know what needs to happen in the proposal. And one of the speakers earlier today said, I'm going to give my capture manager what I need in order for them to get me a winning proposal. I will then create that winning proposal. That's always been my philosophy as well. We've got to work our way back. And so for us in the proposal industry to say, I don't have to spend my time creating a starter compliance matrix. I can research the customer. So, or I can go back and read through the capture plan in a little bit greater detail. I can start using my own industry expertise to make this product better, not just in a functionality of a proposal document from a document management perspective, but from a content management perspective and an intelligence management perspective. I think those who find their time being opened up are going to be able to research more, learn more about their own organization and their own organizational capabilities and become more of a subject matter expert from within. How do you perceive some of these advancements influencing or shaping the technology adoption realm? So AI is yet another layer of kind of consideration when you think about automation in, in the environment. And I think there is a kind of a rush. It, it's like pretty much every hype cycle. I'm not suggesting that generative AI is a hype cycle, but with every kind of new innovation, the internet itself, um, the advent of the smartphone, AI is of a similar kind of stature. And the situation that's most important to keep in mind is that AI has been around an awful long time. It's the generative AI type of AI that is new. Um, And that is something that's very good at certain use cases, certain jobs, and it's not so good at other jobs. So to make that concrete, uh, generative AI is not so good at mathematical jobs. So if I want to reliably, you know, do something in tech land, like read and write to a database. So user management, for instance. You would never use generative AI for user management or for workspace management or for parsing out a Microsoft Word file, but you would absolutely use it for other jobs. So for instance, summarization of text, the creative element of writing good proposals, that's where generative AI can really shine. So I think when you're thinking about AI and the advances, it's important to be a little bit more considered and not rush into situation and maybe avoid some of the, or at least consider some of the products that are effectively just, you know, thin wrappers around a large language model, which is the engine of, of generative AI. So there are a lot of new products out there who claim to deliver all kinds of Nirvana and, you know, silver bullet type outcomes. Just be a little bit careful of those. And I don't say that as a vendor. I say that as a vendor who's been 15 years building product, uh, invisible thread. And sometimes technology and engineering takes a long time. That's just the nature of it. You can't do things overnight and suddenly deliver a robust solution. Along with exploring AI advancements, we also underscore the critical role of cybersecurity. In these segments, we discuss how safeguarding digital innovation is as essential as technology. So we've spoken kind of at length 
about the immense potential of AI, the value it brings, but the potential and the challenges are pretty significant when it comes to cybersecurity. And like AI is a great tool, but it's not without its like pitfalls, especially when you're considering cybersecurity. So how do you view the current landscape, especially considering the importance of staying vigilant and, and being proactive? Yeah, Tan. So uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, which is a really great authority um, for cybersecurity and a bunch of other offshoots of um, IT, uh, launched their AI Risk Management Framework this past January, which is a really relevant timeline, given how, you know, things change and the policy doesn't normally keep up with that change, but they're actually really staying on top of it this time. Uh, and the risk management framework is to help users of AI better manage the risks to individuals, to organizations, and society at large associated with using artificial intelligence, uh, specifically to help cultivate the trust in using AI technologies and promote using AI for innovation while mitigating that risk. And it's a 86-page uh, document, but what it distills down into is um, largely having a holistic cybersecurity policy for your company, not just specific to AI. And it lends itself to the incorporation of that AI system into your overall policy. And that kind of comes down to the basics, right? NIST has a bunch of other uh, documentation and guides for small, large businesses, federal, et cetera. And most of them come down to the simple things that we know of, you know, password management and don't click on malicious links and stuff like that. But those are the foundational concepts where as a company, how you manage your data and segregate the data and don't put the production data next to the HR data because AI is a tool. It's a data aggregation tool. The purpose of it is to take all of that data, put it together and spit something else out. And so you get privacy concerns that way, uh, where something that you might not want to be aggregated into the algorithm might get aggregated. And so you have to have policies in place to mitigate that as you're onboarding an AI system into your company. I, I know when you when you talk about adoption and, and everything, you you also need to stress the need for heightened security. Um, with AI adoption. Can you talk to a little about um, security and elaborate on that? Yeah, so security in AI is kind of a, a really important factor, particularly when you're dealing with regulated industries. Um, and again, I don't know if the awareness is out there to the extent it needs to be. When you're looking at vendors of software, and I guess I can speak from that point of view because that's the area that we swim in, there are an awful lot of vendors out there particularly ones that pop up in the last you know, short period of time, let's say between one and three years, who are promising all kinds of stuff and who are kind of not necessarily keeping in mind what it takes to deploy software in an enterprise setting. When you deal with information security folk in an in a enterprise setting, they have legitimate and valid concerns about the content. And the content, typically, they don't want that content going outside of their firewall. Now, that's a tech way of saying it just has to be 100% locked down. If you think about defense and space, you think about IT services, financial services, healthcare, you just don't want that going into the public internet. So a lot of companies will set up private clouds for that exact reason um, in defense and space or in, in kind of more, you know, situations where you've got CUI considerations and you've got, you know, skiffs going on or whatnot. The, these private clouds are really your kind of your entry point. If you're using LLMs, large language models, which are fundamentally the engine of generative AI, if you're using GPT, for instance, which, you know, OpenAI was the first to democratize the whole uh, generative AI one year ago, actually, with GPT and ChatGPT, once you put that content into a GPT type large language model, it's basically violating the security stance and posture. Because you don't know, there's, there's a number of factors here. You could be training inadvertently, but that's mostly locked down now. I think most of the large language model guys have kind of got options for that. But effectively, your content is going outside your environment. And there's a compliance implication around this. So you don't know if non-nationals are going to be able to somehow interact with that software or that large language model. 
And the reason, you know, a lot of the kind of intent of the uh, executive order from Biden, um, which now is about two or three weeks old, was we can debate the ins and outs of why it's good and why it's not so good, but the intent was a security intent. Um, so what do corporates need to do? I think they need to have a checklist. They need to ask the vendor, where is your LLM living? They need to understand, will their InfoSec people be able to deploy that LLM? My view, and this is our stance as Visible Thread, because we are very conscious of our security posture. It's one of our big differentiation points. For the last 15 years, working with the top defense contractors, for instance, we've always you know, nailed our colors to the mask. Security is the number one priority for us. That's why we are deployed into SCIFs. So for us, you need to deploy an LLM, which is completely isolated. It cannot be trained. It should not be leaking any data outside of the firewall. And the chief information security officer needs to be 100% comfortable that that is the case. Yes, there will be evolution very quickly in the next six months, 12 months around security. But I think in this industry, in this business, you, you just can't take chances on your content, your proprietary content. You just can't do that. Theme three, branding and personal development. Turning our focus to branding and personal development, we've had some enlightening conversations this year across a diverse set of topics. Our guests gave us deep insights into creating authentic brand narratives and importance of personal development. Here are some insights from those discussions. Can you kind of share um, some of your like evolving definitions and experience with flexibility? Um, you know, as your family has grown, it is growing no more. So I'm just going to put that out there just in case the viewers are like, no, we're, 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 we're tapping out of five here. But as your company kind of grows, because I know you want to grow your business into, uh, you know, a different world. So um, how do you establish and maintain those boundaries and how do you define that flexibility? Well, it is, to your point, it's not an easy thing to do. And it's a lesson still, as a woman in my 40s, I'm still learning. Um, I, however, a lesson that I'm learning right now, I'm in a season of life right now where I'm working more, more than I have been before. Um, again, intentionally chosen, right? Working through all the goals that we have in my life for myself, for my company, for my family, um, all of those things. I'm just in a phase where the past year, it's been a lot more work. So to your point, though, uh, with certain clients, when you're not putting up boundaries and you're not necessarily staying true to your vision and your path, here's what I found you end up unhappy, not liking the work that you're doing. Uh, whether it's because someone has kind of guilted you into that or because you've known them a long time, you really want to help out, even though it doesn't align with where you want to go, which is, you know, right? You want to help people out. You want to be doing the right thing and being flexible. Sure, give me a call, you know. So flexibility is important. But when you get that call out of the blue and you really can't take on this initiative or this work, being able to put that boundary up and saying, yeah, now's not a really good time, but I know somebody else who can help you and providing that referral. Um, I think that that is really important. And from the boundary perspective, because I definitely have taken on work and accepted work and working with, you know, my staff and my folks where I, my heart wasn't in it and it showed and it just really impacted yeah. um, my enjoyment of the work that I was doing. So like and if you were to tell your younger self or a, a new um, up and coming professional um, who wants to get into business or someone who's starting out um, their own company, like what one piece of advice would you give them? Oh, I there's think, so many. <laughs> yes. If I could only pick one. I mean, I could, I could do like three steps, right? Like I think knowing yourself is so important. In being honest, honestly assessing who you are, what your skills are, and what you like doing. I, I mean, because I think so many of us end up down a path that we don't love that and that doesn't necessarily align with who we are, that when you can really, whether it's through coaching, whether it's through, you know, just personal assessment, knowing who you are, what your skills at, and what are the things that bring you joy in your life, you know, and so that you can kind of set your life up to do those things, to do more of those things. I think you'll find success in your personal life and in your professional life, you know, exponentially. So, no, and I think that's, I think that's so key, right? Um, and, and it's so hard to teach the young professionals is that you're going to mess up and sometimes you're going to mess up really bad. 
And you have to really kind of own it, um, sit and understand the discomfort or maybe the consequence of what you did and move on. Dust yourself off and move on because if you strive for perfection, you will fail at every single turn. Um, and so I like to always say, be kind to yourself, right? Be kind to others and be kind to yourself because you might actually be in that situation another time. So absolutely. And I think you the the most growth and learning that happens is through failures, is through mistakes that happen. Obviously, nobody wants to make the big, huge mistake. But sometimes in your career, if you make that mistake once, guess what? You're going to be way better the next time because you learned that lesson the hard way. And it really sticks with you and resonates with you. I guess branding is really, it's about controlling the narrative and determining how you want to show up. Um, Not only really to potential clients, but also other audiences. Um, For government contractors, it means also relating to teaming partners um, and potential recruits. So I'd say Part of the key to maintaining authenticity is really to maintain to maintain transparency and consistent in your messaging. Creating alignment among the key stakeholders is really it's huge and it's very often very challenging. Um, when we run our our marketing and messaging workshops for our clients, the first thing that we do is really try to get input from all the key stakeholders and. Um, you know, and try to work towards that alignment. I guess we kind of consider our workshops to be, you know, mostly strategy, but also a part therapy session because it's just, it's really amazing to see how out of alignment um, the memberships, the members of leadership um, are in their thinking and to try to get everybody on the same page is, is really um, can be a stumbling block for a company. And then, you know, once you have everybody's input, then then you really just need to sit down and take a good hard look and draw out what is truly important and then and then the next step after that would be creating very clear and concise company messaging that then flows into important tools like the company website your capability statement sales pitch decks proposals um just really everything because Having the key messaging align across every touch point that your target market comes in contact with. And remember, that could be employees, it could be teaming partners, could be your end client, influencers. Um, you know, that is, that's what actually develops uh, and is the key to brand trust. So you want to keep in mind clarity and transparency and authenticity when you're creating your company messaging. And keeping it consistent, just keeping it consistent. Theme four, leadership and team dynamics. Finally, leadership and team dynamics has been a cornerstone of our discussions. In our episodes, we explored the evolving nature of leadership and the importance of fostering effective team collaboration. These episodes offered valuable insights into modern leadership and team management. Being intentional and actively thinking and setting goals. Internal organizational champions are also critical in organizational change. So identify, you know, what went wrong there. I think one of those things that often goes wrong is just like a resourcing discussion and having a conversation up front, pre-RFP, really working through an overarching kind of capture management strategy of a legitimate identification of the resourcing needs, internal and external, that you need to support a particular bid will save so much time, energy, effort, you know, tears uh, as you're kind of working through these baton passes. Um, Employee consultant burnout is a very, very real thing, especially in our environment. And recognizing that up front, identifying people by name, ensuring everybody's got a backup or that somebody's being communicated with about what is happening within this resourcing discussion, I think will keep the conversation flowing. I think it will reduce baton drops because somebody is always there to kind of pick it up and run, um, even if we've lost time, even if we have to restart something. Um, I think some of that resourcing discussion is something that is a really key takeaway from this as soon and as early as you can identify that so that you kind of reduce the oper- yeah, well, the, the problems that you would necessarily have with some of those burnout issues. Excellent. And um, thinking about resourcing, one of the ways that we have tried to make that baton pass work, especially when you're working with an external resource, 
you're working with a proposal management firm or independent outside consultant, exactly. We like like yourselves or like the company that I used to have, and we still use um, external resources ourselves. Um, is um, trying to standardize as many of those handoff points as possible. And I want to, I'm cautious about using the word standardized because that sounds like really big and heavy and onerous. And I don't, I really try to stay away from that one. By standardized, I mean, just like do the same thing, uh, reduce your decision fatigue, right? So for example, have your, these sound so easy, right? And I'm a big fan. I have it over here on my desk. I should grab it. But uh, Checklist Manifesto is a great book. Um, it's very small. It's essentially the methodology that pilots use, which is called the Check Checklist Manifesto, the book. And it's from, written by a pilot. It's probably 20 plus years old. And it talks about using checklists. Now, you don't have to have, again, formal checklists, but I'm talking about mental checklists. So, for example, if you know that every time you make a bid decision, what are the next things that happen? We turn on this, we uh, stand up the SharePoint portal. We have all the, make the folders the exact same every time. Um, we have a folder that says, copy me, a, a library that says, copy me. And all the subfolders are exactly the same. Yeah. And there's links to our master proposal template in there so that if we change the master, you always are grabbing the latest. So you don't have any decision fatigue. And all you need is one person to know that when a bid decision is made, they turn on that that SharePoint library and that SharePoint library copies the other one. So it's like a two click thing. Nobody has to ask who's assigned. Nobody has to ask how should I organize it. It's always organized the same way. So it helps with that decision fatigue up front and passing the baton. But it also helps that when you're doing the proposal, everybody who's coming in recognizes that folder library hierarchy. They know exactly where to go to find the certain type of documents or instructions, and they don't have decision fatigue asked either. They're not having to text you saying, where can I find the RFP? Where can I find the pink team draft? It's always in the same place on every proposal. And it sounds so obvious, but those little things will again, clear your brain, clear your baton passes. And just that way your brain can focus on the stuff that is added value, intellectual capital, secret sauce, and so on. Yeah. Can, can I grab that thread a little bit? The beauty of doing things like that for yourself is that you create a kind of a culture where everybody accepts that that is what they do. Everybody accesses and utilizes the system, the collaboration platform. Those folders get populated and they are there for <laughs> posterity's sake, which is yeah. great. What I think we often find is we just don't have the files. We don't know where to find things. They're launched in somebody's head. Why are we doing this again? I think I've written this past performance um, response. Where is that? So if you can get into a habit of whether you want to call it standardized or whatever you want to call it, um, people start using the process, people start respecting the process, and then you start having all of those artifacts available in order to expedite and create efficiencies in the future. Yeah. I'll give you a perfect demo. We're going to ping pong a little bit here, if you don't mind, Tian. So um, thinking about is stuff being in people's heads. Uh, when I came on board um, at my, you know, at EdSource, they had all their past performance. I'm sorry. They had all their prior proposals organized by year. So instead of by, because it was in their head, because they knew inherently, oh, yeah, we get on that. It was 2019. It was 2021. They knew to go to that folder. So it was, so seems again, self-evident, but one of the first things we did was like, no, 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 this needs to be organized by agency because then I don't have to ask someone, where would I find that last state department proposal or where would I find that? So little things like that, even how you label it, think about, can somebody find it if without asking me? I'm a huge fan of self-service, huge. Yes. If you have a self-service mantra, then that will go a long way with the baton passing and the efficiency and so on. Yeah. I, I have not heard that whole self-service. Uh, that, that's a really great phrase. Hey, look, it applies to, I use it for raising my children. The self-service. Yeah. Like, but how do you manage millennials? How do you manage the Gen Zers? Like, you know, like, how do you manage different groups of people who have different technology backgrounds? They operate very differently. Like, if anything with COVID has kind of taught us is that some of us were not meant to work virtually. Like some of us were not meant like to work in a virtual environment. They need that um, creativity. They need that organic feedback. Um, they need that connection. 
So how do we kind of embrace this brave new world that we have with all the challenges and still be successful? Take the technology out of it. All right, Anatalia, I'm letting, letting it fly. Pe people, people are very people-y. Title, title of my future keynote, it's out now. Um, people are very people-y. And if you've ever heard me present before, I've done a lot of presentations about leadership and you can always count on that. But I, I, could, I could get a call right now that my son fell and broke his wrist and it would drastically change the way I am showing up in front of you. And so there is a constant variable, the technology, the processes, take all of it out and focus on the people, right? And embrace how someone is showing up, even if it's wildly different than the way you are or the way you communicate. And that goes for leadership too, right? You may report to someone who is just a little different than you are, has different communication styles. But to, to the point, I think it really does boil down to leadership and acknowledging differences and then also realizing that we are kind of regardless of what your generation is or, or your personality style or anything like that. We're, we're apparently alphas up here now. Thanks for that. Um, you know, that, that we're all kind of in the same boat, though, still. We're all, we're all floating in the same boat and with, you know, expectations um, tools and things that are happening with us and around us. And I think when we remember that, and the other key word too is empathy. Sometimes we have to be smacked in the face real hard before we're able to acknowledge another point of view. And it's unfortunate. So um, can you teach it? But you can certainly model it and at least be aware that we are all walking a very different path but we come together on lots of things in lots of ways and tools and technology is certainly one of them. And we're going to approach those differently uh, as people too. So being open-minded. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, with people, it's play to the skill, train to the weakness. And so, you know, I've, I've managed several teams over the years and folks come and go and it's always, you know, Oh, somebody's struggling. You might want to consider getting rid of them. You might need them. They're, they're probably going to need to re be replaced. Um, no specific examples, but to say, let me try to fix them first. Yeah. Maybe they don't know. Maybe we've given something that we did not give them time to learn. We did not give them time to adapt or adjust, or maybe they just haven't figured it out yet. Maybe, maybe they have a different, style. exactly. Maybe they have a different learning style or a health issue or something that they need to get through personally. And as a manager, you can have those conversations one-on-one -on -one without getting HR involved, mm -hmm. but you can also look at that individual you know, as a leader, what is their learning style? Would they do better with a mentor? Would they do better with, you know, take some PTO and just dial it back a minute. You know, how do you get to the best of what that person has to offer on that day at that time? If it becomes consistent or you try to fix them, they revert back, then you know you've got a people issue. But probably you've got an attentive issue, a you know, distraction issue or something that is short term, temporary and can be resolved and fixed. If you don't try to fix the problem first, you're not going to solve the problem. You're not going to know what to do when the next person has that same issue. How have you been able like, to manage that challenge of being authentic, strategic and attentional when there's so many other external factors that kind of, you know, impact all of that? It isn't easy, you know, uh, yeah. you with the best laid intentions. It, it is a daily intentional choice. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I have this cra crazy morning routine that I've been doing for about five years now, probably, probably around the same time. Actually, probably yeah. even before I started my business, I think I was doing this where I am setting my intentions. I am actively thinking about it on a daily basis, right? I think for me, Keeping my life ordered in the way that's important to me allows me to be my authentic self. So whether it is, you know, if you believe in a higher power, for me, it's God first, and then my spouse, and then my family, and then my friends, right? And then work. Um, and it doesn't mean that work never is the top priority of the day. It just means I'm doing that check-in on a daily basis. It is a, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to try to focus on, right? I might write down one day, you know, if I'm going through each of those to keep them in order, I want to make sure I hug my kids every day, each one of them and tell them I love them, right? Something like that, that just allows me to keep all the right things in the right order. It isn't easy, but I try to make it a daily intentional focus of mine to sort of stay on track. 
But going back to um, something that you said before, right? The I think one thing when you were asking me about starting my own business, one component that I skipped that I think is very important. I mentioned assessing your own skills and whether you think you'd be suited for it. The other piece that helps you get the courage to do it, frankly, is to find a mentor, right? For me, we've talked about this before. You were that mentor for me that really was just, you know, you had been, you know, you're finding somebody that's sort of a few years ahead of you that's done what it is that you want to do. So you can sort of look and say, well, I can see how it's done, right? Then you can sort of vision, you know, envision yourself doing the same thing. So I think we had numerous conversations Mm -hmm. along the way where I was sort of dabbling in independent consulting and you were very encouraging and you were just, just do it, just go do it. Right. Like I, you and I think having that friendship and that mentorship, somebody who is just a little further along than you are, who's done it was a huge, a huge jump in the right direction. So thank you. Well, I appreciate that. You're very welcome. You you mentioned the notion of having a champion to guide you through this adoption process. And I think that's so important. Um, It brings a sense of like ownership and accountability, especially given like the AI evolution pace. It's such a rapid pace right now. Um, How do you think organizations could effectively identify and empower like these internal quote unquote champions to navigate through this adoption, you know, like voyage? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and it's just a thought process. Um, from my standpoint, I think the idea of having a champion internally in any enterprise organization is critical to any uh, significant kind of behavior change process with automation. Um, what are the characteristics of that champion? That's a great question. The person needs to be, okay, well, Firstly, it can't be a part-time role, and this is a huge issue, right? A lot of times it'll be, well, I got my day job, I'm, I'm whatever, and I'm supposed to be doing this secondary job, which isn't really being empowered to actually deliver anything significant. So the person has got to be more or less full-time on this. The second element of that person is that they need to have a combination of two skills. One is effective communication, and the second is effective or effective enough understanding of tech. They don't need to be a deep dive tech person. They don't need to be a, a dev person, but they need to have a logical disposition. That's a tricky mix, uh, an effective communicator with good logical talent and skills. They are around, you will find them. Uh, I think biasing towards a younger person, not to be ageist, and I'm not exactly spring chicken myself, but I would certainly bias towards a less aged person. Um, not because they don't have the capacity, they certainly could. They're probably towards the back end of their career. They probably don't have enough energy to kind of push it through because it requires a lot of energy. It's effectively an internal consultant role. And you're liaising with a lot of different teams. You're trying to do a combination of business modeling. Uh, you're trying to do a combination of kind of education, get people on board, uh, understand the tech landscape. So there's quite a bit going on in that role. It is not a part-time role. It's a full-time role. It also can often be thrown into the kind of PMO program management office. That, in my experience, has been the kiss of death because a lot of that office or those offices can often be unempowered and they don't have any kind of real clout in an organization. So the reporting structure of the person, and there should be multiple of these people in any organization, the reporting structure is important. So they need to report more or less, I wouldn't say directly into the C-suite, but certainly one to two steps max away from the C-suite because that gives them power and they will need to bring people along the journey. So they need to have the ability to crack a whip every so often. So yeah. there are the characteristics that gives you success. You don't do that. You just waste your time. It almost sounds like a proposal manager, right? Uh, you know, if we an were to translate that. An empowered proposal manager, an empowered proposal manager. And the, and the exactly. challenge with proposal managers is that they're considered, in many cases, a kind of a back office function. They're not considered as strategic as really they should be. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that challenge that you get where basically you've got an unempowered proposal manager, that's the doom situation. Uh-huh. When you've got an empowered program manager or, or proposal manager, excuse me, life is good. Game five, superpowers. We also made sure that we had a little bit of fun in our episodes, and I asked each guest if they had a superpower to make their business life easier, 
what superhero or superpower would they choose and why? I think it's kind of the theme of this entire conversation. It's the ability for me to help other people communicate effectively. Communication is a single superpower I would love to be able to imbue upon teams of people. <laughs> a little bit of time travel to the evaluation board would help. <laughs> so you want to be Flash. Like, I'm, I'm a big, you know, I'm a big superhero fan. I, I've got a yeah. son, so I know all my DC Marvel characters. So you would be yeah, Flash. Yeah. You would want to be able to, like, time travel. Yeah, maybe it would be a little more about the clairvoyance, you know, element of what are we really, really after here on the evaluation uh, committee board or, you know, those folks really doing that that source selection. But, uh, yeah. Jen? If I had a superpower, it would be to convince all the contracting authorities across the whole federal government to use a standard format and maybe just make it like just like a checklist or something. I don't know. <laughs> maybe that checklist again. But, um, you know, how many times have we seen, we're like, the same errors, you know, in the same RP, like, come on, like, same agency. It's like, maybe I changed my mind. If we all have the same superpower, can we super, superpower it? <laughs> and like, one mega evolve? Out. Like, that's very Pokemon now. We, we all yeah, want to yeah, mega yeah. evolve, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> or like the transformer, like we each. Yes. Like, well done. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I I will say that the the fact that controversial take as well. I think the fact that companies that are outside proposal consultants and that that whole thing exists is just a sign that it's very inefficient. Like, yes, we need uh, we need competition. Yes, we need transparency. But the hours and days and lifetime spent um, cannot be healthy for the federal government in general, right? So my superpower would be, I don't know, somehow to slash that in like half or something. Huh? Love it. <laughs> I have so many, like so many different superheroes that it's kind of hard for me to pick because it, what you're saying, Jennifer, I I, I would love to have, um, and, and this is why I, I like to participate in the reverse industry days that federal agencies have because those are really great opportunities for agencies to understand from the industry side, how we interpret things, how we're receiving or perceiving things. And so um, I, I almost want to be the um, the character from Guardians of the Galaxy. She's, I forget what her name is, but she's the one who's an, em uh, she's an empath. Oh, Mantis. Mantis. Yes. I kind of <laughs> want to be like Mantis, right? Like, oh, you're feeling... You know, and be able to kind of communicate and convey that because um, I think at the end of the day, if we all kind of understood or like put ourselves in the other person's shoes, I think we, it would be huge for everybody to understand yeah. where they're coming from, why why we say what we do, why we do what we do. Um, and it would avoid a lot of this misunderstanding and, you know, controversy. So for me, I think it would be Dr. Strange and his ability to see all the different uh, permutations and their outcomes and um, use that to kind of see the second and third order effects of your um, the integration of AI and kind of mitigate them as you go so that you don't find out after the fact that you did something wrong. So basically seeing into the future and mitigating it. I'm going to stay on the same line of the, the uh, telekinesis or uh, the mental power of Professor X from, uh, from the X-Men. He basically is able to use... Uh, the, the machine to see where everyone is so you can see all the threat uh, and see what they're thinking and uh, kind of work into their minds and do things like that. If I had that superpower of doing that, I can make them take all of their bad ideas and turn them into good. All right, now you're really tapping into my inner geek. Uh, I am a big fan of X-Men comics. Uh, so while that I have to admit that ultimately I think my favorite superhero really is Nightcrawler. Um I think the answer to your question would ultimately be the superpower of continuous adaptation. So I think the winner of the ability to adjust to any situation and ensure their survival would be Darwin. Oh. And if you can tie it to an actual like superhero, like you get bonus points for that too. Okay, well, I'll tell you, because I did do, so I'm part of the National Contract Management Association, yep. NCMA, and last year I spoke at one of their conferences in the leadership develop, um, chapter leaders uh, pre-conference conference, 
and they had us choose a superhero and a superpower, and this one really resonated with me, that would apply in your business life, right? So I'll okay. go there with that. Because while I think flying would be super cool, I'm not going to lie, I think it's, <laughs> I don't know how practical it would be. You know, I can't put five kids on my back and, you know, go fly off somewhere. Um, I, I love the one of, um, have you seen Encanto? Yes. So the, the cousin Dolores from Encanto, she's the one this, with the super listening skills. Okay. Oh. That one for me as, right, a mom of a lot of teenagers right now and as a business owner, right, just that yes. ability to listen and listen well and to hear people. Um, I think that is such a, an important superpower. Well, that's a wrap, folks. And thank you for joining us on this retrospective journey. As we gear up for another year of exploration and discovery, let's keep sharing, sipping, and strategizing. And remember, the secret ingredient is a genuine connection and a glass of bourbon infused with a generous splash of wit. So until next time, thank you for listening to the Optimize Podcast. And that wraps up this series of the Optimize podcast. A big thanks to our host, Tan Wilson, and all our amazing guests from all the episodes. Optimize is brought to you by Visible Thread, the language analysis platform that helps you improve the efficiency and compliance of RFPs, contracts, and mission critical business writing. Using VT Writer and VT Docs can be game changing for efficiency and compliance in your documents. For more information, visit visiblethread.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you are listening. Stay tuned for more insightful discussions on the Optimized Podcast. Until next time, thanks for joining us.